committee will come to order. Senator Mikulski, our chair uh, person, is uh, running a little late. Uh, you never know when traffic and other things happen, General Bolden. So she asked me to go ahead and, and get started. And with your permission, I, I will. Uh, General Bolden, I will, I'm going to give an opening statement, and then we'll see where we go from there. NASA is one of the most publicly recognized agencies in the federal government and an inspiration to young people around the world, motivating them to become scientists, engineers, and explorers. I look forward to hearing from Administrator Bolden about his budget and NASA's plans for the future. The fiscal year 2014 budget aspires to do many new, innovative, and exciting things, yet it proposes General Bolden, no additional funding. In essence, NASA is proposing to do more with less. I strongly believe that this country must continue to push the science and engineering envelope while man maintaining focus on current investments in order to realize tangible benefits. I'm concerned, uh, General Bolden, that the budget before us is an example of chasing the next great idea while sacrificing current investments. This country has finite resources to invest, and while we're committed to NASA's mission, subjecting mission-critical activities to shoestring budgets because a more exciting idea has come along, I don't think is wise. Based on the proposed budget, as well as previous budgets, I have serious doubts about NASA's dedication to tru truly developing a heavy launch capability. I hope you will dispel that. While your testimony, uh, Administrator Bolden, points out that NASA is building the world's most powerful rocket, the Space Launch System, the budget doesn't reflect NASA's commitment to that goal. Instead, it shows cuts to SSL vehicle development as far as we can see. This budget focuses, I believe, too heavily on maintaining the fiction of privately funded commercial launch vehicles which diverts, I think, critical resources from NASA's goal of developing human spaceflight capabilities with the SLS. I've long been a supporter of public-private partnerships that use federal dollars to leverage private resources in everything. In this case, however, NASA has provided $1.5 billion to for-profit companies for the development of launch capabilities but it's my understanding it has no idea how much money these companies are investing themselves, and according to NASA's budget office, the general has no authority to ask. That's troubling. In addition, NASA has no ability to keep the projects on budget or on schedule because of the nature of the contract that was executed. It's also troubling that NASA paid these companies in spite of delayed milestones, shifting completion dates, and an altered final delivery schedule, and then had to provide additional payments in excess of $200 million so these projects could be successful. This sounds like a great arrangement for the companies, but I don't believe it's a great arrangement for the taxpayer. There are many unanswered questions about NASA's vision for the future and how it plans to achieve that vision. With this budget proposal, we have a significant challenge ahead of us, but I believe that with some direction, and some greater and some accountability, uh, NASA's endeavors can be successful and inspire future generations. I look forward to working with uh, Chairman Mikulski and with you, Mr. Administrator, in the coming months. Uh, and I ask that my full statement be made part of the record. And uh, uh, I need to mention uh, uh, that uh, the committee has taken Inspector General Paul Martin's testimony for the record you know, already for what it's worth. Senator Cochran, you have an opening statement. Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to join you in welcoming our distinguished witness to the committee today to review the budget request for NASA for fiscal year 2014. I ask unanimous consent that my full statement be printed in the record. Without objection, it's ordered. Uh, General Bolden, I, I talked with you a few minutes ago, but we officially welcome you to the committee. Look forward to your testimony and, and a question and answer period. And I'm sure the chairwoman will join us soon. Thank you very Proceed much. Proceed as you wish.
Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, first of all, let me, uh, I, I know Chairwoman Mikulski is not here yet, but, but and I've, I've congratulated both of you in private on Thank your you. ascension to the uh, chairmanship and ranking membership of the full committee, and I want to congratulate you again and tell you how much I look forward to working with you in, in all aspects. Um, I want to thank this committee for the opportunity to bear today to discuss NASA's 2014 budget request. Let me start again by thanking this committee for its continued bipartisan support of NASA and the world's second to none civil space program. That support's also reflected among the American people and in the White House as evidenced by the President's $17.7 billion funding request for NASA. The budget reflects today's fiscal realities and aligns NASA's full spectrum of activities to meet the President's challenge to send humans to an asteroid in 2025 and to Mars in the 2030s. As part of the agency's overall asteroid strategy, NASA is planning a first ever mission to identify, capture, and redirect an asteroid into orbit around the moon. This mission represents an unprecedented technological challenge, raising the bar for human exploration and discovery while helping protect our home planet and bringing us closer to a human mission to Mars in the 2030s. This budget also supports NASA's partnerships with American industry partners who are developing new ways to reach space. These partnerships are creating jobs and enabling NASA to focus on new technologies that benefit all of our missions. An industry partner, SpaceX, has begun resupplying the International Space Station with cargo launched from the U.S. and this past Sunday's successful test launch by Orbital Science of its Antares launch vehicle marks another significant milestone in NASA's plan to rely on American companies to launch supplies and astronauts to the International Space Station. Orbital is now poised for its first demonstration launch and mission to the International Space Station later this year. The administration is committed to launching American astronauts from U.S. soil within the next four years, and this budget provides the necessary resources to achieve this goal. This budget fully funds the International Space Station that remains the springboard to our next great leap in exploration. It also continues investments that are developing the SLS rocket and Orion crew vehicle that will take astronauts to deep space, and it supports driving the development of space technologies such as solar electric propulsion that will power tomorrow's missions and help improve life on Earth. This budget continues to build our nation's on our nation's record of breathtaking scientific discoveries and achievements in space with science missions that will reach farther into our solar system and provide critical knowledge about our home planet. Among other science goals, the budget will sustain NASA's vital role in helping us understand Earth's systems and climate and the dynamics between our planet and our sun. These efforts will provide critical knowledge about our home planet and potential threats. We will continue our steady progress toward our next great observatory as we develop the James Webb Space Telescope scheduled to launch in 2018. NASA's programs of innovative aeronautics research is pursuing an ambitious research agenda for substantially reducing aircraft fuel consumption, emissions, and noise. With the 2014 request, NASA begins a new $25 million a year advanced composites project that will focus on innovative composite materials and structures. Mr. Chairman, We've had to make some tough choices with this budget, as I'm certain we'll discuss today, but I'm committed to making sure that NASA is using its resources strategically for a cohesive exploration program that bolsters our economy, improves life here on Earth, and raises the bar of what humans can achieve. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Administrator Bowen. It's hard not to call you General Bowen because we go back a while. Um, Administrator Bolin, over the past two years, in testimony before this and other committees, you stated that NASA's top priorities are SLS Orion, the Webb Telescope, and the Space Station. In your testimony today, you do not take, I believe, a similar position. In fact, you're specifically, you're specifically talking about commercial crew being NASA's top priority. This statement is reflected of this budget with respect to commercial crew. But I'm interested to learn why NASA no longer counts these other programs as, as top priorities and how uh, our long-standing investments in 
these other programs will be impacted by NASA's changing priorities. Could you explain that to the committee? Mr. Chairman, I, I hope this will not be considered a disagreement with the chairman because that's not healthy, but, but NASA's priorities are the nation's priorities, and they remain SLS, MPCV, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, oh. and the International Space Station shored up by a vigorous technology development program and commercial crew and mm -hmm. cargo. The reason I emphasize commercial crew in my opening statement is because this is a year uh, of decision. Uh, we, we promised that we would have a, a commercial crew capability for the nation by 2015 if funded at the President's requested level uh, back in 2011, and that, that funding did not come. We now find ourselves targeting 2017 uh, for the first availability of a U.S. capability to launch American astronauts to space. If we do not get $822 million in the 2014 budget as requested by the President, yeah. it will be my unfortunate yeah. duty to advise the Congress and the President that we probably will not make 2017 for the availability of a, an American capability to get our astronauts to space. And I will have to tell you that I'm going to have to come back and ask for authorization to once again pay the Russians uh, to take our crews to space. We, we just renewed a contract for another year because we weren't able to, to have our, our own capability in 2015. It is not my desire to come back to this committee and to the Congress and the President and ask for more money to pay the Russians. We're, we're joined by the Chairwoman, and I yield back the gavel. <laughs> Welcome, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Mr. Bolden. First of all, let me apologize. It took two hours to get here from Baltimore this morning. I needed one of your rocket ships or something. I, I needed to, one coming, uh, from, to, uh, coming from Mount Vernon. I, too, was late. Well, you're coming from the other side of the Potomac, but uh, I, I'm beginning to think this. Uh, and Anyway, so I really apologize for being late. But it shows the bipartisan nature uh, of this uh, subcommittee and this committee under uh, with my vice chairman, Senator Shelby. I had absolute confidence that he could take this over because we're going in the same direction with the committee and we're going in the same direction uh, with the space program. We do want to welcome you and uh, today is a very compressed day. The hearing must end uh, no later, no later than 1030. Uh, just know that first of all, as we review the president's uh, budget uh, and the facts that we're facing sequester and then the usual challenges of uh, NASA where we ask you to do more than less, uh, there are many things that we would like to discuss with you. But I believe that our overall thrust is that we are looking on a bipartisan basis to be an advocate for a balanced space program. Uh, and a balanced space pro program to us means continued, all of the groundwork for continued human space exploration reliable space transportation mechanisms, both to carry our astronauts and then also to be able to service uh, the International Space Station, to continue America's ex exceptionalism in space science, uh, and to continue our work in aeronautics. Uh, we believe that NASA is an economic engine, and we want to continue out innovating uh, the rest of the world, but at the same time, we have to be stewards of the taxpayer's dollar with oversight and accountability. So having looked at that, uh, Senator Shelby, did you ask any questions yet? I just one. What would you, may I ask? Well, we were just getting into the uh, priorities of NASA. Well, you know, Mr. Chairman, while I go over mine, why don't you continue your line of questioning? But I just wanted to welcome, apologize for the delay. Why don't you do that? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I will, uh, I've got a couple more areas, uh, General Bolden, I'd like to get into. In August of 2011, an independent cost assessment determined that NASA's budget estimates for SLS were reasonable through 2015. These budget numbers assume the cost for SLS, SLS rocket development in the year 2014 would be $1.61 billion. But NASA's budget request, I understand, is $1.38 billion. That's $227 million less than was expected to be needed. That's a large swing in the cost model, you know, that raises questions. 
I think whether the difference is attributed to cost savings or is it a lack of commitment to the mission? Could you explain uh, what that is, General? Mr. And, Chairman, and first why? of all, the, the independent cost assessment uh, was, was asked, was requested, as we have done for James Webb, for uh, SLS, for MPCV, and, and most recently for uh, the commercial crew program. And, and it is not surprising that every time we get an independent cost assessment, one of their first determinations is that we don't have enough money. Uh, so while we, we accept uh, the assessment of the independent cost assessment that, that they would like to see more, they consider it reserve, uh, we acknowledge the fact that we did not have the amount of reserve that we would like to have, but that we were confident that we could carry out this program uh, with the budget that we requested. And as uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer has testified before this and other committees in the past, we are running all of our programs uh, to include commercial cargo and crew at the lowest level that we feel confident we can deliver them on time. So that, that's the difference between the, what the independent cost assessment said they, they thought we should have to provide adequate reserves and what we think we can do the program with. Well, some of us are concerned about the funding necessary for the SLS rocket development. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, the other components, but, you know, we, we, we're talking about yep. SLS rocket. And, uh, and if there's truly cost savings being realized, uh, uh, could you detail these actions and to us, to the committee, and understand how similar measures are being applied across NASA's programs to achieve similar savings? I, I can say that... In other words, we're, we're concerned, and I hope there's not a lot of ground for it, I, I, about SSL. The rock we don't, itself, not the component. Yeah, I, I could stand corrected by somebody in, in, my, in my organization, but we don't advertise that we have realized cost savings on the SLS program. What we have done is we've exercised efficient management of the program. Well, we, we like have, that. We have completed up, and, and, and when we talk about the SLS program, I, I do want to be careful that I, I completely, I include everything that's involved in that program. So we have completed significant upgrades to Launch Complex 39B that is being prepared for SLS. The B2 test stand at Stennis is being prepared for a main propulsion test, which is a critical part of the, of the preparation of SLS for its, uh, its 2017 launch. The J2X engine has undergone numerous tests uh, at Stennis, very successful. We've run it 500 plus seconds more than one time, and that is a, that puts us ahead of the game. I will say we don't need to be ahead of the game with the J2X, but, but because we, we've committed that we would do that, we did. Uh, we recently completed the very first test of a major engine component at Marshall uh, in, in firing the gas generator for a rebuilt F1 engine, um, you know, with Dynetics. And those are all examples of the progress that we continue to make with, uh, with the SLS program. But, General, I, what, my emphasis is on the rocket itself, you know, specifically, not all the, you know, ancillary things and the uh, components. Yes. Uh, because you've got to have that. Yes. Uh, Mr. Beck, uh, I had a conversation with J.R. With J. Thompson that I, I know you know very well, and he cautioned me this uh, Sunday or, or last week when we were waiting for Orbital to launch for me not to become overly aggressive with the rocket and forget that the rocket is built to support an entire program, and I, will, I could very easily find myself just like we were with Constellation. We need a 70 metric ton vehicle, and we are on schedule, on target, on cost to, to provide that 70 metric ton vehicle. I will need a 130 metric ton vehicle probably in 2023. I think we're on, on target, on cost, on schedule in the development of that. It's an evolving system, and we'll get there. But you agree that you've got to have the engine, that's the rocket, to move and go anywhere. And just like you've got to have an engine in a car, you can have the yes. finest components in the world and a, a beautiful seat and a good radio and good tires, but no engine, you're going nowhere. Senator Shelby, you and I agree completely, and I okay. think, you know, it's said that, that all roads to space lead through Huntsville, okay. Alabama. And, and I want to work with you on and, that. And Stennis, and sure that's nice. very true. And, and we are on schedule for having a 70-metric-ton vehicle uh, at the level of spending that, that we have Will you furnish some details on all this to the committee? We will do that, sir. Okay. I'll take that. 
Uh, Madam Chairman, I have one last area to get into, if I could. That's commercial no, space. Please, go right ahead, because your questions are uh, actually identical, Thank sir, you. to what I was Commercial going Space to. Act agreements. I alluded to that in my opening statement. NASA has used Space Act agreements rather than traditional federal government contracts to execute the commercial cargo and crew programs. These agreements lack transparency and incorporate significant schedule leniency. Traditional government contracts provide full insight and control over the contractor and the product throughout the process to protect the government's investment, ultimately the taxpayer. With respect to the Space Act agreements, it's my understanding that NASA has no authority to review the work of the contractors, audit their programs, or investigate in the event of an accident. Is that true? That, Mr. Chairman, that's a, that is a misconception of the, of the capability of Space Act agreements. We have had uh, satisfactory insight and oversight on both commercial crew and cargo. We have embedded teams uh, in the factories of our commercial crew partners, and we're still working fully on Space Act agreements. Uh, they are an integral part, so we have, we have sufficient insight for, for me. Do you, have, do you have to ask the contractor to give you access to the Space Act agreements uh, that could give you uh, some absolute authority over the contractor, and why does NASA prefer that approach as opposed to the other government contracts. See, the reason we this prefer, is a deviation from the government contract. Yeah, the reason we prefer Space Act agreements at this stage of the game for commercial crew is the same reason we did it for commercial cargo. We wanted to, to give the contractor, American industry, as much leeway as possible to produce a vehicle that fulfill the requirements sure. that, that we set. And it has worked very well for us, as demonstrated by the success of both Orbital and uh, and, and SpaceX when we got to the point where we entered into a FAR-based contract. Well, as if you're the one that's paying the bill and they're doing it, it looks to me like that you should be in control of the destiny of that to a point, you know, by, through the contract system. Sir, I, it, again, it, it's a misconception that we don't know what they're paying okay. into it. We are a partner. Uh, okay. When we did the independent cost assessment, um, then, then Booz Allen was able to go into the company, and it is granted it's proprietary information, but sure. but without without a, uh, a revealing mm -hmm. what they had put into it because that's competitive sensitive for them. Uh, we know about what each company has put into. Okay. It. Um, you know we're we're we don't want in, you to be in the dark anywhere because the taxpayers. Uh, we're we're, money. we're not in. I don't feel that we're in the dark with any of the any of the contractors, either in commercial crew or com, or cargo. We 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 feel very confident that we know about what level they're paying, and and we don't we don't know the precise amount because we don't get uh, you know fiscal accounting the way that would be required if we were working under a far base contract, but they are now working under far base contracts. Uh, in the CCI cap program, uh -huh. which is going n not the CCI cap, but but the the requirements definition program. That's that's a far based contract. We have total insight into everything that they're doing. So when we get ready to roll out the the uh, request for proposals here this summer, we'll be confident that we know what they're doing. We just know that this is de a deviation from the regular government contracts. Uh, we most want agencies to make don't sure have that the, NASA. Most, you spends our money wisely, that's all. Yes, sir. And we, NASA uses Space Act agreements judiciously, but we use them widely because it enables us to do much more than any other agency in the government can do for the budget that we have. We use it as a budget tool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really, truly appreciate Senator Shelby's line of questioning because uh, this goes to the balanced space program. and. Actually, his questions were very much along the line that I was going to ask. I was uh, troubled by the fact that there were decreases in the SNL rocket and Orion capsule program by $184 million. But let me get to where I am uh, as the chair of the committee working with Senator Shelby. Um, I'm worried. So let me tell you what I'm worried about. Sir. Uh, I believe that NASA has been constrained over several years now with staying roughly in the 17 to 18 billion dollar range. We're asked, we asked you to make estimates 
And there's been a pattern not only in NASA but across all agencies to lowball estimates. Then those lowballing of estimates tend to be inaccurate. And then along comes something like sequestering, which has a tremendous impact on employees, both our civilian federal employees, our contractors, because NASA is truly a work with contractor agency and has a, a, a fairly good track record on that. And then we're going to get to the end of the day with a fiscal quagmire, uh, <laughs> with a fiscal quagmire unresolved, uh, the, the space agency and other agencies, DOD is the same way and others, underestimating what it's going to take, and then we end up with programs that falter or sputter. And in NASA's uh, mission, faltering or sputtering really can blow the whole program. Yes. So you see where I am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the, these, one set of dynamics, our fiscal quagmire was shut down, slammed down politics that are not characteristic of this committee, in fact, just the opposite, uh, that we have to resolve. Um, and so my question to you uh, as we look at this is that facing sequester and facing the estimates in the president's budget, do you think you can keep these missions of NASA on track and online, or are we really asking for an almost impossible task of you, uh, sure. Director Bolden? And I mean it. Very sincerely, you are a very dedicated person. You, you were heading in a whole different life before President Obama asked you to take this job. <laughs> yes, I know you were going to start a foundation oriented to sickle cell anemia. I mean, you were going to devote your life to inspirational motivation of young people and cracking a problem, a biomedical problem facing Americans. Now you're staying on for yet another tour of duty. So please, let's get realistic estimates so we know what we're really facing and what we should really be doing to maintain a balanced space program. Madam Chairman, I agree with you. And, and let me say, I, my assumption in, rec in recommending this budget to the President and the President's assumption in sending it to the Congress was that between him and, and all of you, the 100 senators and 400-plus members of Congress, we are going to solve the sequester problem in this budget coming out. If that is not done, then, then I will tell you right now, what I'm telling you about today, I can't do. And so you're going to see us come in and tell you that it will impact the priorities that NASA and the Congress agreed to. It will potentially impact JWST. It will impact, it will definitely impact uh, SLS, MPCV, it will devastate commercial crew and cargo. Uh, we have contracts now for commercial cargo. I'll have to renegotiate those contracts. We won't fly the number of missions that we have. You know, right now we're flying 20 commercial cargo missions to the International Space Station over the next five years for three point some odd billion dollars, an incredible value to the nation. I can't carry that out under sequester. Uh, I will probably have, in all probability, have to furlough civil servants, and we have avoided that. So sequester is not good, and I'm not telling anybody I can work a miracle. If we cannot get out from under sequester, all bets are off, and you are absolutely right. I'm going to come to you and tell you things that we're dropping off the plate. But this is the time to tell us. In uh, other words, I, I, this is not in but, the future. But, sequester is here now. So this is not, again, meant to be in any way pugnacious. So here goes, so let's look at the sequester uh, issue. Yeah. And if we do not cancel or find a way to cancel sequester, or what would be the consequences? Would it be simply delays to these projects? Let's take, let's take three things. Let's take the James Webb. Let's take the SLS o Orion. Um, and let's take um, other uh, important scientific programs. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for... Let me just say one quick thing. We are under sequester now, and so we're operating under 2013 budget sequestered. We have made adjustments such that it has not impacted our programs uh, nor our people just yet. 
but we cannot do that in 2014. So you're, you're absolutely right. Should so when come? will it actually affect you? In other words, everybody says sequester is a made-up crisis, an OG. No, it is, it, it, it in is other not words, a made-up crisis. If you have to furlough people, when will you start doing it? If, if we do not come out from under sequester for the 2014 budget, we'll start furloughing people when the 2014 budget becomes effective. That we, would be October 1st. That would be October 1st. We'll have to start looking. So we at have that. some elasticity of time, but not an open-ended situation. Time is not my ally, but time is my friend right now when it comes to the workforce. Well, yes. we are your friend. But yes, anyway, yes. let me go then to the next question. Uh, many of our colleagues have said, oh, give the agencies flexibility. If you have flexibility, of which I wanted to do, and many on the other side of the aisle wanted, uh, there were higher powers, didn't. I wanted to give agencies a 1% transfer authority, reprogramming authority, so we could keep our constitutional prerogatives and that of this committee across programs, not across agencies. Mm -hmm. Like you couldn't go to the FBI and they couldn't come to you, but across programs. Would that solve, would, Transfer authority solve your problem, or is it truly the whole um, NASA that you would be too, still too constrained? Transfer authority, as you describe it, would always be helpful, and that's what we've requested or we have said. But would it solve your problem? Uh, in, was under reason. sequester, transfer authority, even as you describe it, would not solve the problem. We still Why not? Have to, we still will have to drop something from our portfolio. We, we would become a $16.2 billion agency and, uh, you know, we're down almost a billion dollars well, this year, and, and, and we're managing to do that. Uh, un sequester would take us down another huge notch, and, and, and then... What is a number attached to a huge notch? Uh, from, s I think right now we're operating at 16.8, and we would go down to 16.2 uh, in 2014, I, th I think is the right well, number, but I'll get back to Mr. you. Mr. Administrator, my time is moving along, and I'm going to be sure that Senator Cochran has an opportunity. What I would appreciate, and I think members of the committee is, what would be, you've sent me a letter, I believe, in the you consequences yes, of that. Does that outline it pretty well? That outlines pretty well what the effect would be, and, and we gave you, at that time, we gave you what we knew, and, and things have well, probably gotten more dire. Well, since then we, if you have an update or an annex, we yes, would we, like to see. We will do that. Now, let me go right to one of our biggest scientific endeavors, the James Webb Telescope. And if we don't keep that on track, it, where we've already had overruns, I'm very con concerned about. But if we don't keep the James Webb within making sure we maintain all standards and practices of accountability, I'm afraid that the James Webb overruns could begin to eat NASA alive. And you know I'm a big supporter of the James Webb Telescope. I believe it will keep America's exceptionalism in astronomy going beyond the Hubble with not only the power of the Hubble, but would keep us as premier space astronomers uh, for the next 50 years. So here is my question about that. Looking at the James Webb and the fact that there are now additional GAO reports that say there continue to be flashing yellow lights, could you give us the status of the James Webb Telescope. Is it online? How are we doing on maintaining the fiscal accountability that both you and Northrop Grumman promised me and yet address the issues around the GAO? And then I'd like to turn to Senator Cohen. Yes, and Madam Chairman, as I, as I mentioned to you the first time I called, nobody was, was as devastated as I was to find out the, the situation that James Webb was in. But as I promised you, when we restructured the program, we changed the management both in Northrop Grumman and NASA. We developed a new cost and schedule uh, timeline. We are on schedule for a launch in 2018. We have a 14-month uh, uh, pad in the critical uh, path for the telescope. The, the reference that you make to the GAO report refers to two instruments, NearSpec and NearCam, that we saw the vendors were not going to be able to deliver on time, so we modified the schedule such that they could fit in because it's critical that they be on, integrated into the telescope by the time it goes into the large test cell at the Johnson Space Center in, in the next few months. And it is, they are now on schedule to be delivered and will be there. So uh, we are on budget, we are on schedule, and, and I look at James Webb, post your conversation with me, as I do MAVEN and LDCM and some other missions that 
in, in, by doing things differently than we always did them, we now are bringing in missions on cost, on schedule, and we have done that for most of the missions that we have launched in the last couple of years, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, we have a tremendous team that's really focused on the things that you asked us to focus on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cochran? Madam thank Chair. Thank you for your patience, sir. Um, thank you for allowing me to join your subcommittee for this hearing. It's a pleasure to serve as a member of the committee with such distinguished senators as you and Senator Shelby. Uh, Mr. Administrator, one of the um, facilities that NASA administers is the Senate Space Center down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, as you well know. Um, funding is needed from time to time to maintain its capabilities, and I'm here to see if the funding levels that are in the budget are, uh, are, are sufficient to maintain the integrity of the test stand where you will test the engines before you actually commit them to a launch. And uh, if there are deficiencies, I hope you will advise us what they are and your suggestions for dealing with them. Your hospitality when I come to Mississippi. Well, thank, thank you very much. Well, you know, the President proposes and the Congress, Congress disposes. Yes, sir. And that's something that reflects the responsibilities of, uh, of our body in participating in the decisions regarding funding and the expenditure of taxpayer dollars on federal programs. So your advice and your uh, observations about the needs for funding are considered very important. Uh, because we know that you're familiar with the test stand and uh, how it is producing some funding, some uh, additional resources for, uh, for NASA, and we want to be sure that we do our part here to maintain the integrity of that facility. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Administrator, there are many questions we'd like to continue uh, to pursue. Uh, but there's been a special briefing call for senators on both North Korea and Syria. And as the uh, Vice Chairman of the Defense Committee and we who are the appropriators, uh, we need to attend that, um, uh, that briefing. We want to thank you for your ongoing service, sir. And, and it is really noted and appreciated. We have a, you have a big job. We have a big job. Um, and Senator Shelby and I were just talking about the fact that we want to return to a regular order um, of this committee where we would take bills one at a time, uh, but in order to do that, we have to meet our alloc I have to give allocations uh, on between May 15th and May 20th. There's a discrepancy. The Taxpayers Relief Act tells us to mark up uh, our bills at 302A at a trillion oh five. Mr. Ryan has passed the budget at 9666 and taken all of the cuts out of discretionary spending. So we've got that fiscal quagmire that I've talked about. But uh, we're going to work together on a bipartisan basis and we hope that uh, the President through his outreach to others and the House would cooperate and Mr. Ryan would appoint conferees that there could be a reconciliation. I think people don't quite yet grasp the significance of sequester, and we need to, because this is, what's, this is what the discrepancy is. We're set to go, and I've instructed my clerks and, I, and subcommittee chairman, and I know Senator Shelby, we're not only spenders on this committee, we also have a sense of frugality, why spending, and we're concerned that if we have sequester, we could end up by being penny wise and pound foolish by ending up with boondoggles because of delaying schedules, et cetera. So we've got a big job ahead, but so do you. Yes, so please keep in touch with us. And we want to thank you for your co cooperation at this abbreviated hearing. Okay. As we go forward with the markup on our bill, both uh, Senator Shelby and I and other members, along with our, sta our key staff, will be in touch with you. Yes, so. Keep, for you, it's not keep the eye on the ball. Keep your eye on those rockets and telescopes, and let's keep America flying. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. If there are no further questions this morning, senators may submit uh, uh, official uh, questions for the subcommittee's uh, hearing record 
We respect NASA, uh, we ask NASA to respond within 30 days. This subcommittee stands in recess until Thursday, May 9th, when we're going to take the testimony of the FBI Director, Mr. Mueller.